A recent trend in modern chess has been the revival of some ancient gambit openings by super GMs such as Garry Kasparov and Alexander Moratsevich. In the light of modern positional understanding, some of the supposedly reliable defences have come under serious pressure. The Danish, with e4, e5, d4, e takes d4, and now the move c3, conforms to the classical principle of fast development and is a favourite of Scandinavian GMs Jonathan Tisdall and Johnny Hector. Come with me into the romantic world of the dashing Danish gambit. After the classical moves e4, e5, the Danish gambit is distinguished by d4, e takes d4, there isn't really a sensible alternative for black, and now c3, giving away a pawn for fast development, as in most romantic gambits. In my dim and distant youth, I used to love playing through games like this, and I'm going to show you one now by one of my chess heroes, Rudolf Charasek. Now, Charasek was a really brilliant player who might well have been world champion had he lived. Unfortunately, he died of tuberculosis when he was just 25 years old, but that hadn't stopped him playing some brilliant games before this happened. The game was played against a player called Volner in Vienna 1893. Black took the pawn off on c3, and now white offered this pawn on b2 as well by going bishop c4. Black brought his knight out to f6, Charasek played knight f3, and now black played bishop c5 trying to develop his pieces. White took this pawn on c3 with his knight, Black played d6, and both sides castled. White now moved over into the attack with the move knight g5, attacking the f7 square, which is traditionally the most vulnerable square in black's camp. Black hit the knight with h6, and now there came knight takes f7, rook takes f7, and now white exploited the pin on this d6 pawn, by going e5. And black can't take this pawn on e5 because then his queen on d8 would hang to white's queen on d1. Black played knight g4 and after e6 white was attacking the rook on f7 and also the knight on g4 because the bishop on c8 no longer protects it because of this pawn on e6. Black tried to counterattack with queen h4 White took the rook off an f7 check. Black played king f8. And now white defended his king side with bishop out to f4. Black took white's pawn off an f2. Knight takes f2. Threatening a discovered check from this bishop on c5. White played queen e2. And black brought his knight back to g4 check. White shuffled his king into the corner with king h1, which threatens mate on the move with queen e8. Black defended against this with bishop d7, and then white renewed the threat with rook a e1. There's only one move for black in this position, and that's knight out to c6. But then white brought off an exquisite finale. He played queen e8 check, sacrificing his queen. Black took the queen with the rook. White took the rook on e8 with a pawn on f7 and made a new queen. Check. Black has got no choice whatsoever but to take this queen with bishop takes e8. And now white played bishop on f4, takes the pawn on d6, double check mate. The rook on f1 and the bishop on d6 simultaneously attack black's king, which has got nowhere to run. A lot of players have the impression that the king's gambit is a one-sided opening. White simply goes for an all-or-nothing outright attack against the f7 square. Well, the purpose of this tape is to prove that this need not be the case, and that the king's gambit can be a positional as well as a tactical opening, and a very interesting opening at that.
Here's a game from the recent Moscow Intel quick play between Morozovic and Anand, which brought the opening fully back into the limelight at Grandmaster level. Here we go then with teenager Alexander Morozovic's demolition of Anand with the King's Gambit. Anand accepted the pawn. He takes f4, and Morozovic played bishop c4, the bishop's gambit, which I'll be recommending later on the tape. Black went quickly into the main line, or what has become accepted as the main line. Knight f6, knight c3, and then black plays c6, trying to force through the move d5 with gain of time. Morozovic dropped back with the bishop. And indeed, this was an approach which was recommended by Bobby Fischer long ago. But later in the tape, you'll see that I recommend, instead of bishop b3, the move d4. There are certain openings in chess which teach the art of attack. And the king's gambit, that's one e4, e5, f4, is one such opening. But as we will see, the king's gambit is not limited to a death or glory encounter. Instead, White may choose to interpret this ancient but still fascinating opening positionally in the modern style. I often teach my young students this venerable opening as part of their all-round chess education. From the King's Gambit, we learn important concepts such as the power of the centre, the need for quick development, the attack on f7, and yes, how to secure the king too, because after all, 2f4 creates kingside weaknesses. By learning and then employing the King's Gambit, you will be improving your overall chest strength and certainly your overall results. Because it's my perception that most club players still haven't got the faintest idea of what to do against 2f4. So let's see if we can use that to our advantage. And on this DD, I'm going to give you a basic course in the King's Gambit to help you get better at chess. Now the first game is a quite extraordinary encounter. It comes from a tournament played in Tashkent. It's an old game. It was played in 1964. And playing white is a guy called Smirnov. And playing black is a guy called Tikunov, who I'm sure will want to forget this game. But it does give you a very clear idea of the extraordinary power of the King's Gambit when things go right. Well, in this game, Tikunov decided to accept the King's Gambit with pawn takes pawn. We'll see a bit later on that this is the most important move that Black can play in this position and almost certainly his best move because basically e takes f4 destroys the white king side. Black is already threatening a winning move, queen h4 check. So white has got to be very alert to this possibility. There are two good moves for white in this position. The move Smirnov played, that's knight to f3 or bishop c4 which I recommended on another Foxy Openings video. Both moves are playable. But knight f3 is the primary move, just getting the knight to a good square, stopping queen h4 check, and controlling important squares in the centre. Just dropping back one move. e takes f4, what about that? Well, one of the primary ideas in the king's gambit is to go through with the move d4 and form a broad centre. And of course, by dragging the black pawn away from e5, white has given himself the opportunity to play d4 in favourable circumstances. So we're very much looking for white to play that move in the ensuing play. OK, but uh, we'll rejoin the game now with white playing knight f3, and black played one of the most important moves in this position, pawn up to g5. It looks rather a silly move to the untutored eye, because black is not developing any pieces, he's making a move which looks very weakening but this is quite an awkward move for white to meet because for instance black is already developing with a threat in the game Smirnov played bishop c4 and now black went through with this threat by playing g4 and the point of g4 is to encourage white to move his knight to e5 after black after which black intends to continue with the disruptive idea of queen to h4 check this is a little bit awkward for white. Uh, it's a continuation called the Salvio Gambit. It might be playable for white, but in general, I would like to avoid positions, if I can, where my king is on f1 in this particular 
situation. Uh, in general, this position has not turned out too favourably for White um, on the rare occasions it has been seen. So going back to the game, after bishop c4, g4, Smirnov decided to castle, introducing a fascinating method of play known as the Mutio Gambit. Black took the knight and White recaptured with the queen. So in this position, White has sacrificed a full piece, but just look at the advantage in development that he's gained as a result. White has got one, two, three pieces in play. If he was just able to take this pawn, all these pieces would be raining down on the unfortunate square f7, which as we know is the weakest square on the board at the start of the game. f7 is quite often the focal point for white attacks in the king's gambit. This need not necessarily be the case, but when the king's gambit was in its heyday in the 18th century, 19th century, white was winning lots of games due to the direct attack on f7, and we're going to see one such game now. Basically in this position, Black's got to be very careful. If he can somehow manage to defend the position out, okay, he's going to win on material. But he hasn't got any pieces developed yet, and it's not that easy to beat back White's attack, as we will see. Well, trying to put oneself in the mind of the average player is always an interesting challenge. But... I think a lot of people, when they're faced with this move d4, are going to be very suspicious. They're going to wonder what you're up to, because they know the lines are after 4, h4, and bishop c4. But once you play d4, the alarm bells start to ring. And a lot of people are going to say to themselves, OK, if I go g4, he's going to sacrifice a piece. They won't know all the details and ramifications of the piece sacrifice. And they're going to intuitively shy away from this variation. They're not going to touch it with a barge pole. They're going to try and seek safe ways for black. Well, what is a safe way? We know that after bishop c4 in place of d4, black can play bishop g7 and get a good position. He can force white back into a line called the Hanstein Gambit. So I think a lot of players after d4 are going to go bishop g7. They're not going to go for this piece. Hello and welcome to uh, DVD1. On this DVD I'll be looking at how to play the modern Italian game. That's 1e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6 and now bishop c4. A move that is as old as the hills, rapid development, eyeing f7 being the order of the day. But White's idea is much more subtle than just a naked attempt to down black with a quick attack on his weakest point at the start. In volume 1 then we're going to be looking at the classical Italian game which starts with the move bishop c5. I'll also be considering the Hungarian defence which is a solid but passive way to play for black as well. In volume 2 of the series I'll be looking at the two knights defence and well of course this is a much more complicated and aggressive way to play with black there I'm recommending the interesting, to say the least, move knight g5. The two DVDs will hopefully provide something of a contrast for you in terms of a repertoire. Because against the modern Italian game, going back to this particular volume, first of all white plays c3, which seems to faint at playing d4. Black generally counters with knight f6. And now the characteristic move d3, which has become very popular in modern times. This might look like a very quiet move, but actually White's position packs a surprisingly big punch if black even goes slightly wrong. Many Grand Masters have used d3 with success. It has appeared in numerous World Championship matches. This move was out of fashion for a long time. In fact, the whole modern Italian game more or less died a death back in the early part of the 20th century. Because, you know, it was felt that black just simply had too much freedom in this position. Too much choice of what to do. But then many strong grandmasters started to reevaluate White's chances. And of course, the Rio Lopez was one of the main reasons for, um, for the lack of popularity of this opening. And certain positions from the modern Italian game are very similar to the Rio Lopez. Where White just plays in a more restrained fashion with D3 rather than play D4 straight away. Going back one move, we'll also be taking a look at Queen E7. Which again, I would 
put in the category of solid but passive moves, although it is played from time to time. It was a favourite with Alexander Alakine a long time ago, but uh, hasn't been seen much since then. And we'll look at the passive d6. In general, against passive moves, White should change his plan and try to play with d4 as quickly as possible. That's what the move c3 is all about, after all. It's just that in the modern Italian game, sometimes White defers this move to a more propitious moment. He doesn't play it straight away. So that's the intro. It's time to look at some games. And I think you'll find yourself picking up this system very quickly as we go through the games. OK, well now it's time to go straight into the games. My first game comes from the World Under-16 Olympiad, which was played in Turkey in November 2010. It's from the Russia-Turkey match and is an absolutely classic example of what White is trying to achieve when he uses the modern version of the Italian game. It's between Yuri Eliseev and Ige Koksal. OK, well White kicked off with e4. Black played e5. And now White played bishop c4. This is obviously the bishop's opening, but it can quickly get back into our featured line if black plays knight c6 let's say white goes knight f3 and black plays bishop c5 reaching the classic position for the Gioco piano now my recommended move order is to continue with the normal move which is c3 this leaves black wondering whether white's going to play d4 or not in one turn in order to challenge that black normally plays knight f6 he sets up counter pressure against the pawn on e4 and now I recommend the move d3. I think this is the best way to get into the Italian game, the best way to get the type of position we want, and restricts black's options. Black castled in this game, white castled too, and now black plays d6. Bishop b3. All right, well, this is a move order I'm sure you will have to get used to if you play once again. And welcome to DVD2 in this series on the Italian game. That's three bishop c4, which I'm recommending as a good way to play against the symmetrical kingspawn for white. You'll recall, if you were with us in the first DVD of this series, that we were looking at bishop c5 for black here. And I was rec recommending the modern Italian game, quieter version of the old line where white plays with c3 and d3 and aims for positional pressure at the outset. Again, if you've played through the games on this DVD, you will realize just how effective this method can be. And it's a method which has been adopted by many grandmasters over the past 30, 40 years. But now we come to the two knights defense on volume two. This is a different animal altogether. Far more provocative move than bishop c5 because black is allowing white to attack f7 immediately with knight g5. Now white doesn't always take this opportunity but it's the move I'm recommending on the DVD. Obviously, White can play other moves. White can play just dropping back D4, opening up the game straight away. That has been popular for 100 years or so. White can play D3 and try to go back into the quiet version of the Italian game. The thing about D3 here is that Black has more choice than he would have if he'd already committed his bishop to C5. I mean, the thing is, Black's always going to play his knight to F6 in this position, more or less. But he doesn't know quite yet where the best square for his bishop on f8 is. We saw, for instance, in the last DVD that the bishop on c5 can quite often be exposed and has to lose time in order to retreat, for instance, from white playing d4 at some point, gaining a hit on the bishop. So black can play after d3, for instance, bishop e7. He can play h6. He has tried numerous moves there. So I want to limit... Black's choice by playing knight g5. This is obviously a controversial move. This move was branded a duffer's move by Tarash back in the old days. And the jury's still out. Some very sharp situations occur after knight g5. But it's not just a caveman attack on f7. From time to time in Grandmaster play, this move has been adopted. For instance, Fischer adopted it on a couple of occasions. Uh, Kasparov has used it. And so it's not a duffer's move at all. Instead, it just promotes a very complex game. And we're going to be taking a close look at it on this CVD. Well, of course, Black's choice is very limited right at the outset. He's got to deal with the threat to f7. And he can do this in two ways. The obvious way, first off, is to play d5. So that's the move we're going to look at now. White takes this pawn. 
And now it's been known for a long time that knight takes d5 in this position is dodgy. But we must get this move out of the way first of all. Because I would say it's black's most natural choice, despite the fact it's supposed to be a blunder. You know, if black can get away with this move, then of course, why not play it? However, it's rather dubious for two reasons. Now, the first of these reasons is the famous fried liver attack, starting with knight takes f7. I have always felt that this is taking a risk where you don't necessarily have to take one. Now, I'm not saying the fried liver attack is bad. I do say, however, that some very complex situations occur in this position after black plays knight b4. White has to sacrifice a rook in one of the lines. And although the attack might be good, I think that a black player knows this situation well. He can use this, how can I put it, dubious looking situation to his advantage. Because white doesn't make black in the main line of this, this particular variation. He just kind of gets a positional edge. And I would much rather actually go back to the older move, d4, which I think is equally good. And I think this move in general poses black more problems. Now, I'm going to kick off the investigation by looking at a game, an old game, just to show you the potential of this move. Uh, between Leonard Barden, English master, and Weaver Adams. Apologies if you've seen this game. It's from Hastings back in 1950. But it does exemplify the dangers to black in this position. Basically, d4 sets up the threat of knight takes f7 with interest. Hello, I'm Andrew Martin, and welcome to this Foxy Openings DVD on the Ponziani. Welcome to this DVD on one of the oldest chess openings, the Ponziani. The Ponziani begins with the following moves. White plays e4, black plays e5, white attacks the pawn on e5 with knight f3, black defends, and now the Ponziani is introduced with the move c3. In its own way, this looks like a very logical move, as white is getting ready to try and take the centre with the help of the move d4. The drawback to the Ponziani is that it is rather slow, and for the time being, the pawn on e4 is unprotected. And this feature of the position gives rise to many interesting variations. So in this introduction, I'm going to be giving you a kind of contents list to tell you exactly what we're going to be looking at. Now the first moves we're going to be considering are the ones where black makes an immediate attack on the e4 pawn. I think these are the critical lines. The sharpest variation starts with the move d5. Very complicated indeed. Some very interesting tactics come about after this move. Retracting that, there's also the Ponziani counter gambit, where black plays f5. Now the Latvian gambit, where black plays f5 a move before, is considered un unsound. But here, when white has played c3, it's quite an interesting choice for black. I suppose you could say another small drawback of the move c3 is that white is denying the knight on b1, immediate entry into the game. So this also slows down the play somewhat. So black feels justified in lashing out with f5. So another interesting move. The most solid move, and the one which has been played most often at grandmaster level, is again the simple knight f6. Black attacks the pawn on e4, but um, play in this variation is not quite so sharp as in the other lines. I can easily state that these three moves, d5, f5 and knight f6, are the three main lines. The Vienna opening is not an opening system which is given too much attention when we compare it with systems like the Rio Lopez or the Italian game. And I'm going to try to use this to our advantage on this DVD by suggesting some unusual and aggressive gambit systems which have long been forgotten. On this DVD, we are going to examine a couple of exciting gambits that can arise from the Vienna opening. We're going to be looking at e4, e5, knight c3, and now after knight f6, white plays f4, which he hopes will be a kind of improved king's gambit. And just going back to knight c3, if knight c6, then again, the move f4. In my view, these gambits are ideal for young players, attacking players, and people who like to cause uncomfortable problems for their opponents in the opening. You will have to know them well 
but I think if you do, you can expect very good results using them. Despite what the books say, the theoretical manuals perhaps frown on these gambits. They say that if black plays perfectly, white gets nothing from the opening. But how many players do you know that are going to play perfectly? It's not every day you have to face grandmasters and international masters, so against the average player, these gambits are going to prove deadly. Now let's just move back right to the start and consider knight c3. This is the Vienna opening. It's not particularly fashionable these days, and to me that's a very good reason for using it. The first main idea of the Vienna is to stop black from freeing his position with d5, at least for the time being. Whilst black struggles to free his position with d5, white will be developing his pieces. The second big advantage of the Vienna opening over knight f3 is that white keeps his f-pawn free. And we're going to use this option to good effect by playing our Vienna gambits. So at the right moment, white can play f4, open up the game, and hopefully get an attack in traditional king's gambit style against f7. So that's a small insight into the philosophy of Vienna Gambit. And now I'm going to show you just how deadly they can be.